so um, morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this month's uh, perspective on uh, youth mental health uh, seminar, uh, which is organized by the Center of Excellence in Youth Mental Health. So welcome everybody in this room. And also uh, we have various people on Zoom as well. So welcome as well. So it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for uh, this month, Dr. Kelly Kamp. Kelly Klump uh, is an MSU Foundation Endowed Professor uh, in the Department of Psychology at Michigan State University. And her research focuses on the genetic and uh, biological risk factors of eating disorders and then both using animal models as well as human models. Uh, Dr. Klump has published over 285 uh, scientific papers in peer-reviewed journals and also has been well-funded over the years with um, NIH grants uh, to support her work. She has also uh, been a recipient of various awards, including one from the American Psychological Association and as well a Research Leadership Award from the International Academy for Eating Disorders. And besides from all the academic uh, activities, uh, she also, has also been very active in the professional community, including in the past a role as president of the Academy for Eating Disorders, which is the largest international professional organization dedicated to uh, treatment research and prevention of eating disorders. So it's a real pleasure to having her uh, visiting the Douglas today and to give a talk. And she's going to present some work on the critical roles of uh, puberty and ovarian hormones uh, in the development of eating disorders, both from an animal and uh, human research uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And uh, it's great to see you all here and to be here. I did not expect 60 degrees. I will be honest about that, but it is a welcome change. So um, to start, I need to figure out how to get the slide to advance. Oh, I have to do it there. Okay. okay. You can also do this. Okay. Excellent. All right. We are good. So um, to start, I wanted to just set the stage for what I'll be focusing on today. And today I am going to be focusing on binge related symptoms and disorders. And I realize that a lot of people think they know what binge eating is, but it's really helpful to provide a definition to kind of set the stage. So um, what binge eating is, is... Um, the consumption of a large amount of food, typically we define that as at least a thousand calories or more, that's consumed in a short period of time, typically two hours, as you can see in the graphic. And this is key to the definition of a binge with a lack of control over the binge eating episode. If you take that lock, lack of control over the binge eating episode out, many of us engage, that's just overeating, right? So in the US, we have Thanksgiving coming up. We all <laughs> consume a large amount of food in a short period of time during Thanksgiving, right? But we don't have this loss of control over eating. And what that looks like is that when individuals are engaging in a binge episode, they often can't control what or how much they're eating. They kind of describe it as a hand over fist, kind of phenomenon, the, the doorbell might ring, they don't stop. The phone might ring, they don't stop. They can't stop what they're eating. That's kind of what defines something as a binge eating episode. Now, what's interesting about binge eating is we consider it a transdiagnostic symptom. It is present in nearly all eating disorders. So it's a cardinal symptom of bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, other specified feeding and eating disorders, which we used to call EDNOS, which was way easier in earlier definitions of the DSM. What um, other specified conditions are, are um, subclinical, we thought, subclinical manifestations of bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. Binge eating is also present in a large proportion of individuals who have anorexia nervosa. So there are individuals with AN who will engage in binge eating episodes. And it's commonly paired with the use of compensatory behaviors like self-induced vomiting, laxative use, et cetera, to rid themselves of the binge. But we do know that a substantial portion of individuals with anorexia nervosa also engage in binge eating. So this is a symptom that is transdiagnostic. It's present in a lot of different eating disorders. Now, I wanna be clear in my talk today, we're, I'm gonna to be talking a lot about binge eating and some other symptoms, but 
to kind of put this in a con context, most of the data I'm going to be talking about today do not concern anorexia nervosa binge purge type. The samples that we've looked at are normal weight or overweight. We haven't looked at it within the context of low weight. We have ideas <laughs> about it. We just haven't studied it yet. So just to give that context. Now, importantly, there's some other key transdiagnostic symptoms that are present in all of those eating disorders as well. And it's body dissatisfaction and weight preoccupation. So for all of those disorders I just showed, individuals tend to be very preoccupied with their body weight and shape. They're dissatisfied. They might think their arms are too big, their butt's too big, et cetera. And they tend to be very focused on what does my body look like and what does it weigh? So weight preoccupation is being consumed with dieting, checking one's weight, etc. These body weight and shape symptoms are also present in all of those eating disorders that I spoke about a minute ago. So in my research program, we have focused on these transdiagnostic symptoms and looking at a particular question, and that is etiology. So in my lab, we've been concerned about what drives the development of these transdiagnostic symptoms in the hope that if we can understand what's driving these symptoms, we can also inform what might drive the development of the disorders. In my lab in particular, we've been interested in genetic and biological factors. In particular, and what I'll talk about today, although we have data on males, I'm going to be focusing on females. Eating disorders are some of the most sexually dimorphic disorders in all of the DSM. So the sex differences in the disorders that I showed you previously range from two to one all the way up to eight to one. And honestly, the range is more typically four to one to eight to one. That is more sexually dimorphic than depression, than anxiety, et cetera. So in my talk today, I'm going to be talking about how do, do genetic and biological factors contribute to these symptoms in females. So to start, the very first question is, do genetic factors contribute to the development of these disorders and symptoms? Yes. The heritability of the disorders that I showed and the symptoms that I showed has ranged from approximately 50% all the way up to 82% or 94%. Okay, these are from twin studies. These are across the globe, US, Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, etc. These disorders and their symptoms are significantly impacted by genetic factors. This could have been the shortest talk ever. <laughs> you all could go get some coffee, go enjoy the 60 degree weather. Um, if that's all that mattered, if, if only knowing if something is genetically influences what we needed to know, we would be done. But that's not all that matters. I can get that. And the reason we're not all done is that heritability estimates are not static. They can change across time, across context, and across age. And kind of the prototypic um, example in this regard are developmental differences that you see in the heritability of psychological traits and disorders that we've known for decades. So as an example, um, IQ tends to show very little genetic influence in childhood, very little. The degree that genetic genes influence the development of IQ increases across adolescence to the heritability estimates that you typically see in adulthood. And what many of you know, when we think about heritability estimates can change, we also know that the heritability of IQ is much less if you look at individuals who live in poverty. Okay, so we know that developmental factors, contextual factors like living in poverty can absolutely influence the degree to which genes contribute to a develop to contribute to a disorder or symptoms. Now, it's interesting before the studies that I'll talk about today, we hadn't had any developmental studies of differences in genetic effects for eating disorders. And I found this strange. This is when I was doing my PhD. Um, and that's because we know that eating disorders are developmental disorders. They have a very stereotypic period of development. They tend to begin around puberty, early adolescence, pubertal development. And then we tend to see it's rare, not uncommon, but more rare to see new onset cases after age 25. People can continue to have eating disorders after age 25, but new onset cases are more rare after 25. This kind of stereotypic period of development suggested to me that perhaps we would see developmental differences in genetic influences on eating disorders and their symptoms, much like we see for other psychological traits um, and disorders. I have actually gotten this question. <laughs> I think it was during my faculty job talk, actually, um, when someone asked, why do we care? 
Like, why do we care if the degree of genetic influence changes across development? You all, you clinical psychologists and behavior geneticists, you guys like to do math and model, and does it actually make a difference? I would say yes. Because if we can narrow the scope on particular periods of development in which genes are more or less important, that's really going to narrow the scope of the neurobiological and biological factors that are probably playing a role. Most developmental periods, we have a pretty good idea of what's going on biologically. If we find out genes are important or not, that's really going to help us begin to look at the more specific biological and genetic factors. So the overall goal of my talk today is to review studies that examine developmental changes in genetic influences. I am focusing on adolescence. That's because this is the period of time where eating disorder symptoms and disorders tend to develop. And I've used two types of methodologies in my lab and in collaboration with other labs, the classical twin study and rodent models. I'm going to start with the twin study. So I know some of you may be a little less familiar with this design, so I'm going to quickly describe it. So what we do in a classical twin study is we compare differences in trait or symptom similarity between identical co-twins or monozygotic, one egg, co-twins, and fraternal co-twins, dizygotic, two eggs, okay? And by comparing how much a twin is similar to their co-twin by identical or fraternal status, we can infer the degree to which genes or environment matters. And here's how. We would infer that genes have an effect on a trait or disorder in question if the correlation, that's R, between MZ twins is roughly twice the correlation between DZ twins. And of course, this is because MZ twins share 100% of their genes. DZ twins only share 50%. If you see the level of behavioral or symptom similarity mimicking this genetic similarity, you can infer that probably genes have something to do with that trait or disorder. So for example, if you're looking at a twin study, don't even look at the model fitting, just look at the twin correlations. If you see twin correlations that look like this, genes probably matter. That's because the MZ twin correlation is roughly double the DZ twin correlation, okay? What's really cool though, you can also see if environment matters. People lose this part of twin studies. Twin studies are as valuable for understanding the environment as genes. If environment is important, you shouldn't see a big difference between MZ and DZ twins because it doesn't matter. If you share 100% of your genes or 50%, you're equally similar to your co-twin. That would really suggest that the degree of genetic influence is probably pretty low for that trait or disorder, and it's almost all environmental in origin. Now, we do differentiate different environmental effects. I'm not going to do that in my talk today, but if people are interested, I can talk about that too. So if you were to receive, instead of the correlations on the top part of the slide, the correlations on the bottom, you would infer that genes have very little impact on this set of symptoms because the MZ twin correlation is roughly equal to the DZ twin correlation, okay? So we use these um, differences in twin correlations to get an initial indication of genetic versus environmental effects. We then do math, <laughs> we do a lot of math with structural equation models, and it's through the structural equation models that we get those estimates of heritability that you might hear on the BBC or whatever you're listening to at any point in time, okay? So in my talk today, I'm gonna be showing you both the twin correlations, and then I'm gonna show you the estimates from the twin model fitting. I'm not going to walk you through the twin model fitting. Okay, so that's a brief tutorial. So in this very first study in 2000, so this is my dissertation, um, in this very first study, I just wondered, do you see developmental differences in genetic effects on key eating disorder symptoms during adolescence? I did my PhD training at the University of Minnesota, which has tons of twins, um, so I, I made use of their data. We had 680 11-year-old twins and 602 17-year-old twins. These are two separate samples of twins, okay? One very early on in adolescence, one late in adolescence. So that's a twin sample that I used. The, I used a continuous measure of eating disorder symptoms. It's called the MEBS. And I used the total score. The total score primarily taps binge eating, weight preoccupation, and body dissatisfaction. So those core transdiagnostic symptoms. Good news is we did not have enough twins at age 11 to look at eating disorder diagnoses. That is good news. 
bad news, plenty of them were endorsing these symptoms at a subclinical and kind of more continuous level. So that's why we looked at the symptoms. Statistical analyses, we did twin correlations within age, and then we did this model fitting. Hopefully my tutorial helped you <laughs> that I don't even have to go to the model fitting. You can look at this and see the pattern of effects. If you look, so these are twin co-twin correlations between identical and fraternal twins. In the 11-year-old twin sample, there is no significant difference between the MZ and DZ twins, suggesting no genetic influence or very little genetic influence. At age 17, there's a big difference between the MZ and DZ twins, suggesting genetic effects at age 17. So based on these twin correlations, we thought, okay, we're going to do this model fitting, and it's going to show that there are significant differences in the degree of genetic influence between the 11-year-old twin sample and the 17-year-old twin sample. And that's exactly what we found. So these are the model fitting results. And genetic is yellow, environment's green. What you can see is at age 11, there's 0% heritability. This is percent variance. So 0% of the variability in eating disorder symptoms was due to genetic factors. It was all environmental. At age 17, it's roughly 50-50. 50% of the variance was due to genetic factors at age 17, roughly 50% was due to the environment. So we saw pretty dramatic age differences in this first study. Dramatic, so conclusions, dramatic increases in genetic effects across age. And this really suggested to me at the time that adolescence is not just a critical time for the emergence of eating disorder symptoms, but it might actually be a critical time for the genetic diathesis of eating disorder symptoms. However, and I should say there's two replications of these effects now in independent samples showing the exact same pattern of effects. There are limitations of this study. This is a cross-sectional study. These are two different samples of twins. At least theoretically, there could be something different about those 17-year-old twins than the 11-year-old twins that's driving these differences in effects. And we don't have any data on mid-adolescence. This is really early pre-adolescence and late adolescence. There's a lot that happens <laughs> between those two time periods. So we don't know if these effects are real, when does that increase in genetic influence happen? Does it happen at 12, 14, 15, et, um, et cetera? So luckily the Minnesota Twin Family Study is longitudinal. So the second study that we did is we followed that 11-year-old twin cohort. Once the data became available, we could look to see when you're looking at the same sample of twins across adolescence, do you see changes in the magnitude of genetic effects? And they did their assessments every three years. So we had 11, 14, and 17. So these are the 11-year-old twins at those ages. We used the exact same measure of disordered eating. Here's the results. So the 11-year-old twin correlations shouldn't surprise you. Those are exactly the same ones I just showed you. The new data are the 11-year-old twins at age 14 and age 17. And what you can see is that at age 14, we're already seeing genetic influences, right? The MZ correlation is significantly greater than the DZ twin correlation. Those age 17 effects replicate the first study, because in the first study, that was a separate sample of 17-year-old twins. These are new twins at age 17, showing the exact same effects. So based on these data, we thought we would see significant increases in genetic influences, but not between age 11 and 17, it's actually age 11 and 14. And that's what we found when we did the model fitting. Again, increases from 11 to 14. The best fitting model suggested we could constrain the heritability to be equal between ages 14 and 17, suggesting there's no new genetic influences coming online after age 14. It's all happening between 11 and 14. So in this study, we replicated, and again, I want to highlight, these are the same sample of twins followed across time. So we replicated cross-sectional findings of dramatic increases in genetic effects using longitudinal data. We extended these findings by showing that it really is between early and mid-adolescence that's important, not early and late adolescence. There is one replication. Getting twin samples and doing prospective studies is hard, <laughs> um, but Tracy Wade in Australia has replicated these findings in a longitudinal sample as well. So this, you know, 
research is always, oh, we found this. Okay, great. What's next, right? So we started wondering what might account for these findings? What could account for increases in genetic effects from 11 to 14 in girls? Puberty. The main age of puberty in girls is 12.5. So this was kind of puberty's like smack dab in between age 11 and 14. And what we wondered is whether we were seeing some sort of activation of genetic effects for eating disorder symptoms during puberty. Now this is entirely plausible biologically. Genes turn on and off throughout development. That's why we get pubertal development, right? Is during puberty, genes turn on, code for proteins that leads to changes in growth, breast development, et cetera. So at least conceivably with all of these biochemical changes at puberty, is it the case that these biological changes are somehow activating genes or leading to differential transcription of genes that uh, proved to be risky for eating disorders and their symptoms. You could look at this in a twin study. So what you can do is instead of comparing across age, you can compare across pubertal status. We're kind of narrowing the scope, right? The first was 11 to 17, then 11, 14 to 17. Now forget age and let looks, let's look at twins who differ in their pubertal development. So that was the third study that we did. We compared the magnitude of genetic effects in twins who are prepubertal and pubertal. We went back to that 11-year-old twin sample. Even though the mean age is 12.5 of puberty, some of the 11-year-old twins had already begun pubertal development or in late puberty. So in this study, all of the twins are the same age. The difference is their level of pubertal development. They're all 11. We used the same measure of disordered eating. We assessed for pubertal development. We did it using the pubertal development scale. We have parent and child reports on this scale. And what we did for these analyses is we took the sample and because there was variability in pubertal development, but it was still you know, pretty skewed. So we couldn't look at pre and post puberty. We did pre and early puberty group and then a mid to late puberty group to see what we would find. And here are the results. So in 11-year-old twins who are in pre to early puberty, there's no difference between the MZ and DZ twins, suggesting environmental factors completely. The pubertal twins who are 11, you see a big difference, suggesting genetic effects in that pubertal twin group. So based on these twin correlations, we thought we'd see pretty dramatic changes in genetic influences across puberty. And we did. And the, I mean, these graphs look remarkably similar, right? Like it's age, smaller ages, and now puberty. Um, genetic factors accounted for 0% of the variance in 11-year-old prepubertal twins, but accounted for 50% in twins who are in mid to late puberty who are age 11. So based on these data, we concluded that it looks like puberty may activate genetic effects for these eating disorder um, you know, symptoms um, going from zero to 50% of the variance. What's interesting, I didn't show you these results, but you can actually fit models in which I bring back the 14 and 17 year old data and I can see, can I constrain the degree of heritability to be equal once someone's gone through puberty to what it is at age 14 and 17? And the answer there is yes. The best fitting model said the only difference in heritability is between pre and mid early puberty. There were no more changes after that. There are now two replications of these puberty effects in other twin data, not using the same twin sample. So really suggesting that there's something going on at puberty. However, uh, is there some symptom specificity? So the measure that I'm using looks at transdiagnostic symptoms, but I've got binge eating, body dissatisfaction, weight preoccupation, right? Are these pubertal effects there for all of these symptoms or is it specific to a particular type of symptom? And I think this is important because these symptoms tap similar, but there are some distinct neurobiological processes that we would think might tap something like binge eating versus weight preoccupation. And this again could narrow the scope of what we're looking for with these puberty effects. So in study four and five, um, I'm going to combine them here, we actually examined whether these pubertal effects were present for all of these symptoms or just one particular symptom. Uh, and the data for this, finally, <laughs> everything else was Minnesota, which is where I did my doctoral training. And uh, 
We started twin registry at Michigan State. We now have over 33,000 twins in the registry, which we're super excited about. It's open for people to use. So if you're interested in it, let me know. Um, but all of the data now that I'm gonna talk about come from our twin registry. We had 936 twins from the Michigan State University Twin Registry. Here are the demographics. We couldn't look at everyone who's the same age in this study. They were broad ages, so we regressed out age prior to doing models to make sure that we're looking at puberty. There's the demographic characteristics. Now, none of these could be on medications or have chronic medical conditions because, as you'll see in a moment, we did additional studies with this sample that that would have been a major confounding variable. Measures of disordered eating, I use that MEBS binge eating. The MEBS also has subscales. They have a binge eating subscale, so I looked at that. And then the MEBS also has a body dissatisfaction, a weight preoccupation subscale. I looked at that. And then the eating disorders examination questionnaire has a weight and shape concern subscale, so we looked at that too. Pubertal development, exact same measure I used before. Analyses, I'm only gonna show you the model fitting because for limited time. Again, we regressed out age and we also regressed out BMI. So BMI, body mass index changes significantly across puberty. It's also influenced by pubertal processes. We wanted to make sure that any effects we're seeing were not due to changes in body weight across puberty, that it was actually due to some pubertal process independent of body weight. These symptoms are intercorrelated. Binge, I said they, they co-occur in disorders. So what we did too is when we were looking at binge eating, we regressed out all of the body weight and shape scores. And we were looking at the body weight and shape scores. We regressed out binge eating to make sure we were looking at specific effects of each. And here are the results. So these are the results for binge eating, genetic effects only, binge eating, and body dissatisfaction. These are genetic effects only. And what you can see is we only see these changes in genetic effects across puberty for binge eating. There was no change in the degree of genetic influence on body dissatisfaction. It was only binge eating. And we had these exact same findings across all of the different weight and shape scales that we looked at. So we could constrain heritability to be equal across pubertal development for body weight and shape. We could not for binge eating. So our conclusions from these series of studies is that the effects of puberty on genetic influences seem to be actually specific to binge eating. We had no changes for body weight and shape concerns, and we feel this really highlights a potential role for systems that influence food intake or repetitive processes or reward processes um, in the activation of genetic effects. It's a hypothesis, but we think it kind of helps narrow the field. But... <laughs> Man, humans are complex. You, you're hearing me do backflips here. We regressed out age. We regressed out BMI. We had to do all this stuff because humans, you can't experimentally manipulate these humans, right? There's all kinds of things happening at puberty in girls. And we, once you regress all this out, you're not going to have enough variance left to even look at the analyses, right? So because they're so complex and we're like, oh, God, we're done. I don't want to regress anything else out we turn to animal models, okay? <laughs> so luckily I don't do the animal models. I have awesome collaborators um, who we now are kind of very close knit labs, um, but they do these animal models. So our aims in these animal models were twofold. First, I'm gonna say one, I'll say another in a minute. When we first started going, okay, we got to do animal models. I can't control for everything. The first aim was, can we at least confirm that puberty is a period of biological or genetic risk for binge eating in female rats? Female rats don't care what their butt looks like, right? They, they're not, I've, although I've asked, it's, I'm like, it's a licking body to say, is that anything? And my clever is like, no, Kelly, you can't model that. Um, <laughs> But they're just a simplified model, right? Is it the case that we see the emergence of binge eating phenotypes in rats even? And what we are interested in, if puberty is a significant period of risk, we should see binge eating emerge during puberty, even in rats, right? Not just humans, but in rats. Here, we're not looking at genetic influences. Now we're just looking phenotypically, do we see increases in binge eating? If yes, then some of these processes are likely linked to biological and genetic factors. 
Okay, here's the model that we use. It's the binge eating resistant, binge eating prone rep model. Okay, what we do, we do, we model natural individual differences in binge eating proneness by exam examining the consumption of intermittently presented highly palatable food, Betty Crocker vanilla frosting, <laughs> and an outbred strain of rats. We do not weight restrict them. We do not food restrict them. Okay, these rats are eating chow all the time, child, chicken and vegetables, right? All we do is Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 24 hours, they get access to Betty Crocker frosting, okay? And then we measure it one, four, and 24 hours. They also, it's a choice paradigm to some extent. They can also have chow, chow, water, Betty Crocker frosting. My RAs cannot even, they, do, they cannot smell it anymore. That frosting is so disgusting. Okay, binge eating prone rats are the ones who consistently, greater than 60% of the time, consume in the top tertile of frosting intake, and they never consume in the lowest. So 60% of the time, they are eating the top 30% of frosting consumption across the whole sample, and never in the lowest. Are binge eating resistant, 60% of the time are eating in the lowest tertile, and they never eat in the highest tertile. Okay. And the, again, we don't food restrict them. We don't give them a running wheel. This is natural individual differences in preference and consumption of highly palatable food. Now, if you're going to do an animal model, you got to spend a lot of time talking about face validity, right? Here's the cool thing. Our binge eating prone rats do not binge on chow. They eat the exact same amount of chow as the binge eating resistant rats. So it's not, an, it's not over consumption in general. It's preference for that Betty Crocker frosting. Okay. Okay, uh, my animal colleagues like, you can't say that, Kelly, but I do. So they seem to have a loss of control over their eating episode, right? And what did I say is the cardinal thing of binge eating? It's not consuming a lot. It's losing control. We know this because Mary Bo this is Mary Bogiano's model. One of her postdocs did a study where she had binge eating resistant, binge eating prone rats. They were in a cage. There was an M&M &M at the end of the cage. There was a line. And she let them go get the M&M, put it back, go get the M&M, put it back. Well, then they started shocking them when they crossed to go get it. Binge eating resistant rats had the species specific response, which was to stop, freeze, did not go after the M&M. Hell no, I'm not doing that, right? Not only did binge eating prone rats not stop, they endured increasingly severe foot shock to go get the M&M. To me, that's a loss of control because what's a loss of control? Continuing to engage in the behavior, even though you dread the negative consequences, right? So in women who have bulimia nervosa, uh, binge eating disorder, it they very much fear the negative consequences of binge eating, which is the effect on body weight and shape. Despite those negative consequences, they cannot stop, okay? Interestingly, there are no differences in body weight or obesity, so Mary put them through diet-induced obesity, equal numbers of binge eating resistant, binge eating prone, probably wondering, shouldn't they weigh more? They're eating more frosting. It's only intermittent Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Binge eating resistant rats, they still eat the frosting, right? It's just that they don't eat as much frosting. But having said that, this is a finding we're really interested in to see if there's kind of metabolic differences between these groups. But I say this, it's not a diet-induced obesity paradigm. This is really cool. We have more female binge eating prone rats than male. So it mimics the sex difference that we see in humans. Okay, so that's the face validity for this model. So the objective of this study was to look at does binge eating proneness emerge during puberty in female rats? We had 30 female rats. We followed them from pre-puberty into adulthood. We defined their binge eating prone status in adulthood using the feeding test in adulthood. And then we looked back to say, when did they start becoming binge eating prone? Were they always binge eating prone before puberty even started? Or did they only start to consume way more frosting during the pubertal period? Here are the results. So this is their palatable food. This is their frosting intake in pre to early puberty, mid, mid to late and adulthood. There's absolutely no difference between the binge eating prone and binge eating resistant rat Frosting intake in pre-puberty. They're eating equal amounts. The puberty emerge or the puberty. <laughs> the difference emerges during puberty. Binge eating prone rats consume significantly more frosting starting in mid to late puberty. And then of course they're different adulthood because I defined their binge eating prone status in adulthood. 
So that's not the surprising finding. The finding is no differences before they started pubertal development. Here's chow intake. There is no emergence of chow intake <laughs> during puberty. Binge eating resistant, binge eating prone rats track together in their chow intake. They also track together in their weight. Their weights were so similar that I couldn't separate the lines in the graph. So this is not a difference in chow intake, not a difference in weight. The preference for highly palatable food emerges during puberty. Binge eating proneness emerges during puberty. This can't be accounted for by differences in chow intake or body weight. We've now replicated this effect in four separate samples of rats, so we're pretty confident it's a robust effect. And this really suggests that puberty is a period of biological and or genetic risk for binge eating. So what's happening at puberty? Holy smokes. A lot. <laughs> so if we go back to humans, right, there's a lot happening at puberty, boys and girls. I have one of each, and I can tell you this is not a female thing. Boys, too. But there are neuroendocrine changes that drive pubertal development in girls, and we have relatively ignored these changes in estrogen and progesterone. And what we wondered is, do we see increased heritability, going back to the human studies, and biological risk due to the activation of ovarian hormones during puberty in girls? And we wondered about estrogen in particular. Estrogen comes online early in pubertal development and increases in a linear fashion, which is similar to what we're seeing with genetic effects. Progesterone only comes online after first ovulation. That's after first menses, roughly. That's too late in pubertal development to account for those pre-early versus mid to late puberty findings. What I didn't know as a clinical psychologist and behavior geneticist, I had to learn all this after my PhD, is that hormones are steroid hormones. They directly regulate gene transcription in the brain. They turn genes on and off. They turn genes on and off in key neurobiological systems for binge eating, dopamine, opioids, and serotonin. So at least conceivably, it could be when these hormones come online, you start to get differential regulation of risk genes for binge eating that then leads to later binge eating. What's interesting, what many people don't know, but we've known since the like 70s, estrogen directly causes changes in food intake. It is a pretty potent regulator of chow intake, and now we know palatable food intake as well. So you could look at this in humans. If we go back to humans, instead of looking at age or puberty, let's get estrogen levels. And let's compare girls who have low versus high est estradiol levels and see if you see differences in genetic effects. That's what we did in this study. This is the same. This is why we couldn't have people on like hormonal contraceptives in that study I talked about before, because we actually got their estrogen. Same twins, same measure of binge eating. We use salivary estradiol. We took it for three days in a row. This wasn't longitudinal. It was cross-sectional. Okay. We see significant differences in genetic effects across estradiol levels. I'm going to warn you, maybe not in the direction you expected, or I expect it. Although, well, yeah. What you see is actually stronger genetic effects in girls with lower estradiol levels during puberty than in girls with higher estradiol levels during puberty. Man, the whole story would have been way easier the other way, right? Estrogen's increasing during puberty. So as you get higher estrogen levels, that's when you're going to see more genetic effects. That's not what we saw. The heritability of binge eating across estrogen levels was 61% in girls. This is not longitudinal. These are two separate samples of girls. In girls with lower estradiol levels during puberty and 18% in those with higher estradiol levels. So really significant difference, just um, a decrease across those two groups. I do want to say we controlled for age. We controlled for body mass index. We controlled the, for the physical changes of puberty. We wanted to make sure this wasn't a reaction that people have to from their environment in terms of breast development, skin changes. We partialed those out. And this is not due to the onset of menses. So in this study, genetic effects on binge eating may be activated during puberty. Genetic effects were three times higher in girls with lower estradiol levels. I have to be clear here. We have a study of the menstrual cycle where women are spitting for 45 consecutive days um, and giving us estrogen and progesterone across 45 days in binge eating measures and their twins. We see the exact same thing in adulthood. Lower estradiol levels, stronger genetic effects. 
Again, genetic effects were three times higher in girls with lower estradiol levels across the menstrual cycle. So how does this jibe with increased heritability of eating pathology across puberty? Like you have to, as a researcher, you have to go, what the heck's going on? Here's our working hypothesis. Once estradiol is activated and starts to increase, we are seeing stronger genetic influences on binge eating in girls who have comparatively lower levels of estrogen than their peers during the pubertal period. And it's the subsample who have lower estradiol levels that's driving these increases in genetic effects during puberty. Now, there are some implications of this. The implications of this is that estrogen may be protective against the development of binge eating and against um, genetic effects on binge eating. Higher levels of estrogen may code for normative development. That makes sense from an evolutionary perspective during puberty you are supposed to have rising estrogen, right? And that does, is supposed to have an effect on your brain and behavior. Lower levels may result in abnormal development or risk and later disordered eating or binge eating, I would say. So here's our working hypothesis. Lower levels of estradiol during puberty may result in decreased expression of protective processes or genes and increased risk for later binge eating. That's a lot. I just threw a ton. It's like the end of a class period and you put the most complicated stuff at the end. So I apologize. It's a lot. How could we examine this working hypothesis? Well, animal models, right? Using our animal models, we began to examine this working hypothesis. What you can do if estrogen is actually protective and it's actually humans who have less estrogen that show more genetic influences and more binge eating, you can take that sample of rats and you can take out their ovaries prior to puberty. And then what happens to binge eating proneness when they don't have ovaries online? I mean, that's the lowest level, right, of estrogen, none at all. And then you can examine rates of binge eating proneness in rats who did not have their ovaries during puberty and in rats who did have their ovaries during puberty. So that's what we did in the final study I'm going to talk with you about today. We did prepubertal ovex ovarectomies, and we expected higher rates of binge eating proneness in adulthood in rats who did not have their ovaries during puberty, because we think estrogen is protecting. We conducted prepubertal ovex in 30 rats and left 30 intact. They had their ovaries the whole time. Compared binge eating prone rates in adulthood. Here are the results. So indeed, we did see higher rates of binge eating proneness in adult female rats who had prepubertal ovex. So in intact rats, oh, it, it, that should be a period, not a comma. Um, in intact rats, rates of um, binge eating proneness was about 10 to 20%. There's multiple ways that you can actually calculate binge eating proneness. It was around 10 to 20%. But in the rats who had prepubertal ovex, it ranged from approximately 30 to 45%. So we saw significantly more binge eating prone rats in those who did not have their ovaries during puberty. This was not due to differences in chow intake or body weight. We standardized their PF intake by body weight because if you pre, if you do a prepubertal ovarectomy of even an adult rat, they gain weight. So we controlled for body weight. We still saw these differences. And then this one too, again, we were like, oh God, okay. We replicated it in three separate samples of rats to make sure that we saw this. So removal of ovarian hormones before puberty causes significant increases in binge eating. Rates of binge eating proneness were three times higher in prepubertal ovex. This suggests that lower estradiol levels may be risky for girls and may cause abnormal development, at least with regard to binge eating, and that higher levels may be protective and lead to more normative, normative development in terms of binge eating risk. So to conclude, our data suggests that developmental changes in genetic effects for binge eating are present. It really seems to be not an age effect, but a puberty effect. Key mechanisms likely include biological and genetic factors during puberty might be due to estrogen activation during puberty, and lower levels of estrogen might drive effects via a disruption of normative development. I would add to this, and this really is specific to binge eating, we did in the estrogen study, we looked at body weight and shape, um, body dissatisfaction and weight and shape concerns. Again, no differences across estradiol levels. It really is binge eating. 
So current studies that we're doing to try and flesh this out more, we're continuing our animal studies of hormone effects on neural systems. We have um, adapted uh, Cecilia's uh, awesome technique for looking at axonal growth across adolescents to see if we take their ovaries, and this we're doing in males too, we go and adectomize and we take out the ovaries. Do we see different growth of axons during puberty? And is it this different growth of axons during puberty that is coding for binge eating risk? We're doing other twin studies in adulthood. So I love puberty, but I also am just interested in ovarian hormones. Really cool designs in adulthood that you, you have to capitalize on natural changes in hormones, right? The menstrual cycle, every woman who's ovulating, we know exactly what our hormones are doing. The peaks and valleys are going to vary, but in every woman, if you're ovulating, all of our estrogens going like this. And then you ovulate, your estrogen goes down, progesterone comes up, progesterone's low, and then you go into menstrual bleeding. Well, if you do a longitudinal study, they spit in a cup for you for 45 days, you can look to see if those natural changes in hormones that are that are predicated, it's driven by your reproductive system, predict binge eating. And the answer is yes. We have binge eating rates that are that differ significantly across. The lowest rates are in the follicular phase when estrogen is high and there's no progesterone. So we also now are doing a study of oral contraceptive effects. I can talk about that too if people are interested in that. And then we just got a grant to look at menopause because that is another period where you might see differences. Finally, we did a pilot study where, where we do um, fMRI in pre-ovulation, post-ovulation, daily hormones to see what brain reward pathways might be activated. And yes, we do care about males. Um, we have a male twin study where we're looking at androgens across adrenarche and gonadarche. Okay, have to thank Linda so much for inviting me to come here. Um, so many great colleagues here. I've been to Montreal for conferences, never been to the Douglas. It's beautiful. Y'all have a wonderful city and campus here. All the collaborators on my previous slides. Alex Burt is the co-director. She's in the corner of the twin registry with me. Cheryl Sisk, up at the top, she is the animal researcher. All the animal stuff is done in Cheryl's lab. She's an amazing collaborator. Um, Alex Johnson, down at the left, he's now our newest animal collaborator. Um, Kristen Colbert, former PhD student, who's now my co-PI in a lot of these grants. Debbie Cashy, she recently passed away, um, unfortunately, from cancer, um, but she has been the statistical, uh, for our animal projects, the statistical brainchild of it all. And then Katie Thacker um, in the middle, she's our co-PI on our menopause grant because we actually got the money to do psychosis risk during menopause. And so we added on the um, binge eating stuff. And then Bill Iacono, Matt McGue, my advisors, always, always thank your advisors, especially if you're using their data. I still use their data. Um, Kendra and Jen were my project coordinators. Ray and Natasha did all the animal stuff and then funding. And that's it. Well, thanks so much, Kelly, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I really like and enjoy as well how you, you know, combine like the animal work with more the human side. So thanks so much for this uh, really great and very clear presentation. Uh, so we have time for questions um, from the audience and also through Zoom. Uh, if you have questions, you can type into the chat and I will read them out. We can start with uh, any person. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, very interesting as well. I noticed one small change, like in, in humans, you get free and early puberty, like that was the effect. And in mice, it was mid to late. I don't know if there's like an explanation for it, or it's just a tiny small difference in definition. Yeah. Um, part of it is what I've learned through working with Cheryl is that staging pubertal development in rats is a little tricky. Um, so uh, in the so let me start in the girls. What we do is we divided them at 2.5 on a scale of one to five. That 2.5. So what that means is that everybody who's in the pre to early group has said on all these different indicators, puberty has not yet begun or it's barely started. And then everybody in the uh, mid to late puberty have said puberty is definitely underway or it's finished. So it's really kind of pre to early, mid, late, post puberty in the human stuff. And then in the animal stuff, I was calling it, I was calling the first group pre-puberty and Cheryl said, given that we can't, we don't have physical indicators, we just know, you know, the opening, she said do pre to early and then the mid, it's, it's an estimate because you don't have kind of the physical indicators. If you look at that too, I mean, it's not like, 
And this is what's interesting to us too. If you look at that trajectory, it's not like it all of a sudden starts increasing right after pre to early puberty, right? It's kind of in the middle there. Um, and we're not, we haven't been able to kind of look at what's going on there to know if it is similar or different from what we're seeing in the girls. Um, also in the bigger models with the girls, we don't divide them in the um, MSU TR sample. We were also able to fit models where you don't divide them into groups. You just look, is it a linear increase? Is it a non-linear? It seemed to be a pretty linear increase across pubertal development without doing the groups. But we haven't been able to do that in the rats yet. That was an amazing awesome. Oh, thank you. Lots of questions, but I'll start with one about genetics. Um, yeah. So you you find this um, the genetic components that is also modulated by the presence of estrogen. But did you think there's a relationship there? I mean, what if it is that whatever genetic components are having that's driving this effect is also influencing the low estrogen? Yeah, no, it's an excellent question too. So in the twin models, because we were worried about that too, not worried, but there's kind of two competing hypotheses. One is mediation, one is moderation, right? We, I presented moderation where it's the level of estrogen that is impacting other genes, that's moderation. But you're right, it could be actually that the genes for hormone production are leading to lower levels. And those are the same genes that are influencing binge eating. The cool thing with these twin models is you can fit a model that's called G by E in the presence of RGE. So that mediation model I just described is in behavior genetics land. We think of that as a genetic by environment correlation, gene by hormone correlation, right? Where it's not actually a moderation. It's the same genes that are coding for estrogen and binge eating. When we fit those models, you can constrain shared genetic variance between estrogen and binge eating to zero. So it doesn't seem to be the case that it's the genes for hormone production that is also contributing to binge eating. It is that whatever that hormone level is, it is impacting genetic risk through other mechanisms. Now, that doesn't mean environment may not play a role, right? And I think this is where we can get into thinking about things like extreme dietary restriction and anorexia nervosa. So what that data also suggests is it almost doesn't matter why your hormones are low. It could be low because you just run lower, right? Or it could be low because you are severely dieting. You're lowering that hormone level. And then we're getting the hormone by genetic risk that we see. That's one of the things that we're interested in looking at, actually. Um, so that's the cool, I mean, that's why I love actually that estrogen is actually a moderator and not a mediator, because I really think that means that experience and environment are somewhere in this model probably too, and playing a role in terms of why are girls' hormone levels varying. And to some extent, it's probably due to genetic predispositions to high or low, but there could be environmental things that are making their estrogen lower. I guess the other question is to follow up on people's kind of circulating estrogen versus being on the estrogen is actually in the Yeah. The mechanism of acting that if I was to conceptualize it, is that you have um, genes that are ready to be translated, transcribed <laughs> because they're being activated by a certain amount of estrogen, although it kind of goes against the high low situation, but that's sort of canonically how the hormonal signaling is working in terms of gene expression. Um, but then you also have locally synthesized estrogens yeah. in the brain. Yeah. So you do have, are you trying to tease that apart at all? Is there potentially an inverse relationship where the brain is generating more estrogens locally because systemically there's less? Yeah. We have no idea. That is a great question. Um, it's a great question. We don't know. And, and of course, there's also the issue of estrogen has genomic effects, but there are also non-genomic effects of estrogen that could be playing a role here too. Um, we're not sure at this point. We're hoping so. The, I, I think it would be really hard for us to tease that apart in our human data, but in the animal data, that's absolutely something that we could, I mean, I have to be honest, this is what's so funny to me. So we, we've been able to get funding for the human stuff. The first animal grant, all that stuff was funded through my intern, all the animal stuff has been funded through my internal money. NIH would not give us any money. So we have not been able to get money until we submitted a grant doing the axonal growth 
and we just got our percentile back and it's 18th percentile on the first submission. Thank you, Cecilia. So, you know, I think if we can start to get traction and get some funding to try and start to look at those questions, I think they're going to be really important questions. What's interesting is when we say that the heritability is lower at higher estrogen levels, that might actually suggest that you could have some membrane actions of estrogen because if they're not genomic, right? you would expect it to occur in everyone regardless of genetic underpinnings. Um, so these are all the things we're hoping to look at if NIH, the thing that really rubbed me, <laughs> NIH saw our paper on puberty, did a whole story on it, asked me for my graph, put it on their website, and never fund us. I was like, this is just awful. So anyways, if you Google that graph, it'll come up on an NIH website, but they've never funded it. So there you go. We have a few questions in the chat. So we have a question in the chat from uh, Howard. Uh, when we're talking about pubertal activation of genes, do you know anything about epigenetic influences during that time period? Yes, hi, Howard. Um, <laughs> good friend and colleague for many years. Um, we really, I mean, I don't know um, of any Howard. On our project, um, we haven't started looking at epigenetic changes. We have started to look at contextual variables that might impact that activation of genetic risk, and we think is through epigenetic changes. So, for example, my student, Megan McHale, amazing student, by the way, um, is really interested in the effects of disadvantage, socioeconomic disadvantage, poverty on risk for uh, binge eating and eating disorders. In our large twin sample, we actually, not only do we have parental income, we have neighborhood disadvantage. It's called the ADI, it has 17 indicators of the level of poverty in your neighborhood from uh, medium income percent, in the, in the United States percent who get free lunches, it kind of looks at everything. And Megan looked at, do you see differences in just A, the degree of genetic influence on binge eating in girls from advantage from or disadvantage? And B, does it do anything to this pubertal effect? Yes. So in girls from disadvantaged context, the curve of genetic risk gets shifted earlier. You actually see it more heritability, not more, but you see some genetic influence during pre to early puberty in those girls from disadvantaged contexts. So again, what this really suggests, and again, you know, the thing about all, and I took that slide out for time, but usually what I talk about at the end is also, like, I'm really interested in biological and genetic influences. This is like one piece of this huge puzzle, right? So we think hormones matter for genetic risk, but there are going to be other things that are going to matter for genetic risk as well. And at least in these disadvantaged contexts, we're seeing the curve of genetic risk go sooner. There's so lots of different hypotheses about this in terms of if you look at a macro level, um, food desert, food swamps, right? You've got differences in terms of the food environment, which might be have a different activation pattern with genes. But at least at a twin level, Howard, we are seeing it with a contextual variable like disadvantage, but we haven't done any methylation studies or anything like that. Although Megan does have a, a small grant to do look at methylation in another sample. We're just waiting for the methylation data. Hopefully that answered your question, Howard. Okay. There's another question in the text from Michael. For the ongoing study on the role of hormones in men, are you looking specifically at binge eating or other types of disordered eating behaviors such as excessive weight lifting? Um, yes, great. Another great question. Y'all have great questions. Yes, we're looking at binge eating, um, what we think of as muscle dysphoria, um, and all the body weight and shape variables we're looking at in that data as well. Um, we're in year four um, of that grant, but what's really interesting about boys, we're seeing the same pattern, which is why I really do think this is something about what is normative in development with regard to your hormones? So in boys, again, it looks like higher testosterone is actually protective. In boys, it's the boys with lower testosterone levels that we see stronger genetic influences, more binge eating. But what's interesting here too, is it really the, the period of risk is shifted a bit to adrenarche. So adrenarche is when you get the activation of um, androgens from... Um, the adrenal gland, and we're really seeing that it's happening there, that by the time you hit puberty, that ge those genetic effects are already there. 
So that's something that's really, because when we first just looked at gonadarche, I'm like, no, heritability is always there for boys. And then we're like, oh, wait, androgens get activated sooner in boys. Let's look at adrenarche. And that's where we saw an increase between boys who had not even started adrenarche. And then when they did, we saw an increase. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Let's time to move for one. Yeah, Dennis. Amazing talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. You mentioned the uh, gene gene as a transagnostic phenomena, and the opposite have been more disorders as well. Right? I was thinking of how much of that you also do hormonal there you know it's funny because we have if anyone wants to do it we did measure depression and we measured anxiety um there could be studies i can say i'm not aware of them that have looked at it it would be super easy to do i mean you could do the exact same set of analyses i just did with the depression we have the cdi on these kids we also have the mask we have anxiety symptoms on all these kids you could absolutely take a look and see what's happening because right i mean depression you see sexually dimorphic increased during puberty do we have a very similar effect going on and and I, you know, I think, and we we haven't looked, Megan's actually really interested in negative affect, depression, and anxiety. Um, in our lab, we're, we started to move a little bit more towards, because of the binge eating piece, also like reward processes and appetitive processes. Um, but it, we absolutely could look at that in this data, for sure. I don't know. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's so satisfying and really good to see you. Um, I have any questions specific to the process that we did in the class. But I'm really curious that we did. Is it considered as a specific binge, no matter if it's salty, if it's sweet? If yeah, that's it, really. Yeah. It have, you know, an impact because if you were giving salty food, if the child you mentioned there was a binge that was noticed, so I'm just curious if you would have for that. And, yeah, no, it's a great, great question. I would much prefer a bag of chips to frosting myself. Like, give me the chips, right? Um, it's a great question. We accidentally did that. Um, so uh, frosting is not fun to work with in the lab. Um, we Some of the rats rubbed it all over themselves. Like they do really weird things with the, <laughs> with the uh, frosting and it's kind of hard to measure. So we... Um, practice with different food pellets that had different um, combinations of um, high fat, high sugar. We have not done salty, savory, but high fat, high sugar. And one of the pellets was a little bit closer to the frosting. Another one was not close to the frosting, was away. Um, and basically, and this was in the pre-pubex, um, pre-puberal OVEX study, we see the same kind of effects, but they definitely are strongest for something like frosting. Frosting has a pretty high fat content, a little bit lower sugar content. When we reversed it and with the pellets that we actually um, use, when there's more sugar and less fat, the effects are a little bit more attenuated. So I think it does matter. The other thing, when we switched, I, I mean, I'm Cheryl and Alex are running these studies, so I do whatever they want. I was a little worried that just the feel on the rat's tongue and stuff of the frosting versus the pellet could make a difference. But I'm like, sure, you know, we'll do this. Um, moving forward, we've, we've been using the frosting, but I think diving into why that might be, it's going to be important. Also, we know across species and humans, males prefer protein more than women, period, prefer highly palatable food more than men. And that's true in humans, in rats, across species. Men tend to prefer more high protein. So I've also wondered, is my sex difference just because I'm using highly palatable, high fat, high sugar? What if I gave them a big boost of protein, which a lot of boys are doing these days too, to get muscular, would I see different effects? You know, if we could get funding for these studies, these are the sorts of things that I think we'd really like to do. Great question too. I think 
No, and it's a great question. We always get this question. No, um, in the studies that we're doing now, we are, um, but we did not do that in the past. Um, and that's a really important question when you're thinking about the appetitive processes and also kind of what, what systems might be involved. So we're starting to do that now. And also because those rats don't seem to gain weight, right? And so maybe they're moving more, et cetera. I mean, it's interesting when you go watch these rats because like, again, both like the frosting, but the binge eating resistant, like mosey over, have a little bit, go back, whatever. And like the binge proner is like, blah, 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 you know, yeah. That you see the behavioral dis, um, difference, but we haven't looked at the things like like locomotor. Alex Johnson also is very, he does um, licking microstructure. So we're really interested in knowing too, in the binge eating prone rats, is it that they like the food more? Are we seeing more licking? Do they want it? We need to go through some progressive ratio tasks, like really figure out what is it with these rats. So, yes, so so beautiful talk. Uh, so I, I keep on thinking about the finding with the with the of rats. So we're seeing that there is like a you know a trajectory and then in puberty this but and and low estrogen in humans is associated with that. But in rats they don't have puberty, right? Mm -hmm. Well they have vaginal opening, which is the beginning of but the with the, the ovariectomans. Oh, no, right. This is what we were talking about yesterday at dinner. So, so oh, go ahead. So how come they, they don't always or very early start with the change? They do. Something? That's data I couldn't show. I knew I included this for a reason. Hold on. Here you go. Look at this. This is exactly what you would expect. So we did track their palatable food and chow intake across development. Okay, and what you can see, BEP, POVEX, those are the binge eating prone rats that had the prepubertal ovectomy. They're the uh, solid black line. Um, BEP intact. I think I actually do some fun. So, okay, I do. This used to be in the talk, but it was too long. In uh, feeding test one, two, three, which is before vaginal opening for the intact rats, right? All of the rats. You see, there's not really a difference in their intake between binge eating prone, binge eating risk resistant. Doesn't matter if you have your ovaries or not, they're pretty similar. And then what you see, if I do that, there's a big difference in palatable food intake after vaginal opening, but the pattern is different, right? Oh, and then there's a difference in adulthood. Look at that. So this, these are our intact rats. This looks a lot like the graph I showed you, yeah? It's increasing, but really ramps up what we would think of as like mid-puberty, right? Right. This isn't one of those samples that we replicated that effect. These are intact. Look what happens to the POVX. Yeah. Oh, it's like, a steep increase, super steep increase. Yeah, that's it's earlier and it's significantly steeper slope. Interestingly, look at these BERs. Uh -uh. In BERs, the ovarectomy didn't matter. Oh yeah, so six kcal difference in PF intake, whether you're a BEP rat that has their ovaries or not. One kcal difference in the binge eating resistant rats by ovary status. It's not, POVX is not affecting those binge eating resistant rats. Yeah. Why? Yeah. I don't know. I know. It's a specific effect of prepubertal ovex on binge eating prone phenotypes. And this is why we think these are rats that are genetically predisposed to some binge eating prone phenotype. And then the hormone activation or the lack of the hormones is hormone by, what else did I say here? Okay. <laughs> That's exactly. And so we also did this, not even looking at binge eating prone or binge eating resistant, just in all rats, PF intake and chow intake. And you tend to see this effect where if you are POVX, chow intake will increase immediately. It's just not even close to how steep it is with those binge eating prone rats. I think that's all I had. Oh, and here's chow. 
You don't see it with chow. We had some weird thing. You got to love this when you do these, right? That was a weird spike. We weren't sure what it is, but in general, you can see there's not that same effect. There's body weight. So in these analyses, again, I told you we standardize for body weight because the P, whether you're a BER or BEP, once the ovaries are out, you gain more weight. So we can, we standardize by weight. Great question. I'm so glad I kept those. Yeah. Thank you. So well, thanks again, Kevin, for this great talk and also for uh, all the great questions. So, uh, mm -hmm. so the end of today's time. Thank you. And I hope to see you all in the next uh, seminar as well from the Center of Excellence. So, thank you, Thanks. Yeah.